Good morning. Glad you're here. Uh, if you got one of these on the way in, uh, I don't know what you should do with it. Um, we're glad you're here. We're glad you're watching. This is a strange time that we are in. Um, we'll just acknowledge that from the beginning, and then we'll try to move through things as normally as we can. We are in a, a season as a country, uh, as a church, that maybe some of us have never experienced, and we'll just acknowledge that. We want to pray um, together about um, what we can do to care for each other. It's an opportunity, a unique opportunity for us to be the church, for us to be the people of God um, uh, and light in this city uh, in a time where, where people can see more and more of Jesus. So um, we just want to acknowledge that from the beginning. We're just going to try to roll through things as normally as possible. So here's where we'll go. On the 29th of March at 6 p.m., our hope is to be able to meet at Harmony School, uh, to have a night of casting vision and seeing what God is up to among us and seeing what, um, what he w would do in us as we continue to see um, where we're headed with this school. We, we want to purchase it. That's our desire. That's our hope. That's where we're moving. And so we want to have you all there to tour the facility, to be there, um, to hear about um, what it's going to look like financially and what it's going to look like for us to be in that space. So uh, March 29th, 6 p.m., make sure to mark your calendars and be there. Uh, I also want to keep pointing out, even though we're not, you're not sitting here, um, that we exist off of the, the giving, the generosity of us together as a body. And so even though we're not meeting here on a Sunday, we're still functioning as a church. We still want to see our vision and mission moving forward, the vision and mission we believe God's given us. And so um, there are lots of ways you can be giving, and we'll uh, encourage you to continue to do that. There's also another unique opportunity for us um, in this season of, of being together or not together as a church um, to ask questions. We've done this over the last several weeks where you can have uh, times to ask questions about what we're walking through as a church in the text, in John. And so if you have a desire to ask questions as we post uh, this video and, and post our liturgy for Sunday mornings, um, you'll have a space to, to even write in questions and, and dialogue in that way, and we want to want to be able to do that together. So that question and answer time is still there. All right? That's announcements. Um, I want to go ahead and invite you to grab a Bible. So wherever that is, if you're sitting on your couch, hop up, get a Bible, and make your way to John chapter 4. Uh, maybe you uh, don't know where John is, that's fine. New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Go ahead and grab it and get to John 4. And as you're making your way to John 4, I want to remind us of the six dreams that we put in front of us as a church together. We um, uh, put these dreams in front of us um, as, a, as a church to, to remind us of where we believe God's taking us. We, we did this in September, and um, we, we've got these printed. Uh, maybe you have them, maybe you have it on your refrigerator, but let me just point out the first two. Uh, the first two dreams we have are these, that we desire to be marked at, by a missionary mentality, and we desire to be marked as a church by conversion growth. We want to see God saving people. And, and so um, those are some things that, that we want to keep putting in front of us, that, that we want to see God save people, and we want to be marked by a missionary mentality. And so here's what I mean. If you haven't been with us, here's what I mean by mission, missionary mentality, that you and I are in places for a very specific God-ordained reason, that the neighbors you have maybe you've had for years, are, are the neighbors you have in part so that you can show the love of Christ to them and communicate the truth of the gospel to them. You and I are missionaries. We're missionaries sent to our specific contexts, and, and it's true that we're called to embrace a missionary mentality, but, I, but I'll ask the question, do we own that? Do we own that as our own? Do we see that as our assignment from God? We want to be marked by a missionary mentality as a church, again, pleading with God that he would save. And so we want to do that. And this isn't just for people. Missionary mentality isn't just for people in foreign lands who are called to be full-time missionaries. This is for you and I in our own context, whatever that is. And so this morning, we come to a text where we learn about missions, we learn about missions from a perfect missionary. Now, that may be a new term for you, 
But very simply, a missionary is one who is on mission. In, in fact, in, in relation to the Bible, that mission is to communicate the love of God and the truth of the gospel along with a call to believe. So there's a call to believe. And a missionary is one who's in a specific context, understanding that context well enough to speak the truth uh, to the lies of that context, the lies that, that people would believe. So this may sound strange, but as we see the interactions of Jesus this morning, we can learn from him, really the perfect missionary, we can learn from him about missions. Uh, maybe you've heard this before, but John Piper, a, a pastor and author uh, from years past, said in his book on missions, he says this, that missions exists because worship doesn't. Think about that. Missions exist because worship doesn't. He goes on to say, but worship is ultimate, not missions, because God is ultimate, not man. So, so in other words, there is a worship problem. There, there's a worship problem. That, that men, women, boys, and girls are not worshiping God. And because God is above all things and worthy of worship, missions exists. The need for a voice to speak the good news of Jesus is necessary. And so this morning, we learn from Jesus. We learn from Jesus, the perfect missionary. And so I want to read the entire passage this morning, 42 verses. It's a longer passage, but I want to get the flow of the story, and then we'll point out a few things that we can learn from Jesus as we consider the end goal as worshiping God in spirit and truth. Now, um, you, you may be in your comfy chair, so I'm not going to ask you to stand as we read, but I'll go ahead and read the text. You can follow along, starting in John now, four, we'll read all the way through verse 42. So here's what it says. <clears throat> now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and parted, uh, departed again for Galilee, and he had, had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews, but the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, 
He will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Just then the disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with the woman, but no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so that the, sow the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days, and many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this indeed is the Savior of the world. This is God's word. That's a long text. But listen, we, we've got a lot of time because you're sitting on your couch, you're sitting around um, with your family, and you, you can just be there for a long time. So here, here we go. We start with the setting. Let me just set the stage for, for what we see in this longer passage um, here in, in, in John 4. The, Jesus is in the region of Judea. That Jesus knew that the Pharisees were about to raise a stink about the fact that he had made more disciples than John, even though that's not entirely true because John tells us that Jesus wasn't baptizing anyone. Jesus decides to avoid this controversy altogether by leaving Judea and heading for Galilee. And I want us to notice something in verse 4 in the setting as we get going. What does it say? I don't care what version you're reading from. It, it says something like, and he had to pass through Samaria. He had to. Now, this is subtle in the text, but I think it's something we learn here from Jesus in his desire to increase the worship of God through what we would say is missions. And it's this. This is subtle, but it's intentional. John says that Jesus had to pass through Samaria. But geographically, that's not true. Jesus did not have to pass through Samaria to go to Galilee. He could have taken a longer route around Samaria. In fact, in this day, the hatred of the Jews for the Samaritans dictated their travel plans. They made arrangements around Samaria so they wouldn't have to go through Samaria. John doesn't give us any information one way or another about why he did that or how, but we're told Jesus had to pass through Samaria. Jesus didn't have an issue with going through a region that had been filled with what Jews call half-breeds. They didn't have a good view of them. These, these half-breeds, Assyrians and Israelites, intermarried and brought together tradition and religion. And so the people of Samaria built a rival temple on Mount Gerizim, which, which we'll see here in just a second, and looked to it as their own place of worship. And the Jews, because of that, the Jews of Jesus' day were not at all fond of the Samaritans. And, and we're told that Jesus had to pass through Samaria, had to go through Samaria. And so he comes to a place called Sychar, which John tells us is near a place where Jacob gave his son a, a well, which is a great place to crash after a long hike through the heat. We're told, John gives us the detail, that it was the sixth hour, which is noon. So it's hot. Let's just walk through what was customary in this day. We, we, may not, we may not understand this. It may not be something that we grasp, but it was customary in this day for women to go and, and get the water. 
And this was typically done early in the morning before the heat of the day. The mornings around the community well were, were like any hip coffee shop here in town. Um, not only was it a practical stop, right, for, for caffeine, um, uh, but it was a, a social stop, like, like the coffee shops here. But, but for the well, anyone who was anyone would gather there in the morning to get water. But Jesus doesn't go there in the morning. He goes there at noon. Let's just hear this. This is simple. Uh, he goes there at noon as a man with nothing to gather water. The crowd at the well is going to be pretty small. Why did Jesus go to the well at this hour without a bucket? I think we have to ask that question. We're told in verse 6 that he's wearied by his journey. This, again, is subtle, but, but he's human. He's wearied by his journey, but we also have to see that he was intentional about being there. It was intentional. Right, so, so there's the setting of what we're about to see, an interaction with an unlikely person. In, in this interaction, we see that this is missions. What we're about to see is missions. I, I think we see different ele elements that make up missions. In verse 7, we see that a Samaritan woman comes to the well to get water at noon. Why? Right? Why, is this, why is it that this woman comes to the well at, at a time when no one else would be there? Right? Did, did she oversleep? Right? Her alarm didn't go off. It, was she an introvert? She didn't want to be around people. What was going on that this woman would come at noon? If all the other women come in the morning to get water, why did this woman come in the afternoon to get water? It was because, we'll, we'll see this here in just a bit, she was an outsider. She had probably been ostracized by other women. And, and was looked down upon by everyone. So she went during the time of day where she knew no one would be there to give her grief about her living situation. And, and, and why did Jesus go to a well at a time when no one would be there and, and he went there without a bucket? I think that question has to come to mind as well. And it's because he was intentional about being with those who did not yet see him as Savior. I think we could say the motivation was, at least in part, his love for others, that, that, he, that he was loving others. Love compelled him to be near those who were unlovely. Another gospel account, Luke chapter 19, verse 10, we're told that Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. That, that's why he came. He, he did that out of love. And even the woman sees the paradox in their interaction as they come together. And so she pushes against this issue. What, why are you here? She asks, why are you a Jewish man? She just rolls through it. Why are you a Jewish man asking me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? The, the whole situation is abnormal. But it's because of this that, that we learn from Jesus about his intentionality of being in situations where there may be an opportunity to extend love to those the world does not love. And I think we can learn from Jesus about a missionary mentality. Now, let me ask a few questions for our own application. <clears throat> when was the last time you went anywhere because you knew there were going to be people there who didn't yet know Jesus. Maybe even people, the world around us, doesn't really love. When's the last time you went anywhere because you thought, oh, people who don't yet know Jesus are going to be there? Maybe a, a, a question that hits our hearts a little more is this. Are you more concerned about what your Christian friends may think of you if they find out you were there, wherever that is? Think about it this way. Jesus, a Jewish man, intentionally sought out a conversation with a Samaritan woman. We'll see here in just a bit what was probably promiscuous. It, it wasn't sinful for Jesus to interact with her. What well, wasn't sinful for Jesus to interact with her but it was absolutely culturally taboo. It, Jesus came to seek and save the lost, so he placed himself in opportunities where, where, where they would be there. Are, are we doing that? 
I'm not suggesting that it would be good for us to step into situations that, that, that may tempt us to sin. So maybe you've got a history and something that may tempt you to sin. So I'm not suggesting that you would step into those places, but I am suggesting out of a deep love for others that we would move toward those who don't yet know Jesus. And I don't want to pull something out of thin air here from, from the text. I, th- I think we see it here. Uh, one of the greatest ways to form a relationship with others who don't yet know Jesus, and maybe you've had experience w- with this, one of the, the greatest ways for you to form relationships with others who don't yet know Jesus is to invite them in to, to serve you in some way. Do you see it in the text? Jesus said to the woman, would you give me a drink? And, and that, as we'll see here, opens up an opportunity for conversation, the, the possibility of relationship. So what could that look like in your neighborhood? Just go there. What, what would that look like in your neighborhood? I've, I've thought a lot about this. If I ever need some um, help moving something, which I've, I've had um, uh, areas where I need help moving something, uh, I'm not the most muscular guy, which I know the camera adds 10 pounds, um, and all those pounds are muscles. But uh, um, it, I, I've asked people in our church to come help me move. Think about this. I've got neighbors all the way around me, right there around me, who could help me, but for some reason I bypass them. What bridges could be built if I invited them in to, to be a part of serving me and me serving them? Again, all of that, a love for others. This is missions. This is missions. What else will we learn from Jesus' interaction with this woman? And in verses 10 through 15, we see Jesus' initial offer um, of life. He offers her life. Missions includes an offering of hope. He, he extends an offer of hope. The Samaritan woman asks the question, why are you talking to me? And Jesus answers in verse 10, if you knew two things, you would have asked me a different question. If you knew a couple things, you would, you would have asked me a different question. If you knew the gift of God, and if you knew me, if you knew those two things, you would have asked a very different question, and you wouldn't have been worried about the cultural taboos that, that you sense between us. You see, Jesus is drawing the conversation out. He didn't answer the question about cultural taboos. He went straight to the fact that he, uh, she was asking the wrong kinds of questions. Right? Well, woman, you're, you're drowning and you're asking if your swim cap matches your suit. Th- those are the wrong kinds of questions. Jesus is offering this woman living water, the hope of eternal life. He, he connects the idea of water, which is right there in front of them, uh, to an offer of fulfilling her eternal need. And she doesn't get it. And so she asks, how are you going to give me this overflowing water? You don't even have a bucket. Not only that, but, but you can't be greater than our father Jacob. Right? And he, he had to dig this thing out, and, and it's deep, and he had to figure out a way to get a bucket down to the water. And you're lounging beside the well without a bucket altogether. Are you saying that you're greater than Jacob? He gave us this well. He drank from it himself. His sons drank. His livestock drank from it. Are you really saying that you could top that as you sit beside the well? And so Jesus offers a a, a hope again in in another way by saying, look, uh, this water that you're talking about is not going to do the trick. The water in the well is not going to do the trick. You're going to be thirsty again. Trust me, the water... I'm offering is different. In fact, if you drink this water, it will overflow into eternal life. But the woman is clueless. The woman is clueless, but but Jesus doesn't allow the conversation to get away from him. He keeps bringing it back to the message, and she just doesn't get it. And the woman says, oh, okay, I, I got it now. Right? Yeah, I'll take some of that water. I'm tired of coming here to draw water. It's hot. It's tiring. Listen, I have to come here daily. This never ends. I'll take what you're offering. She, she doesn't get it. That Jesus is offering hope, hope that will fulfill e- eternally. Have you been there? You're talking with someone about the gospel, and, and it just seems to be going nowhere. What do we learn from this? What, what does Jesus' interaction with this woman teach us? It teaches us, it teaches us this, that, that he uses the very thing in front of them in their current context to intentionally offer 
hope. It's not fake. It's not contrived. It's, it's not some trendy hook to get people to have spiritual conversations. Hey, do you want to have free pizza? And then hear, hear something about the gospel? Or, hey, do you want to come to our Easter egg hunt? No, it, it's relational. It's intentional about something that's right there in front of them to tie that into an offer of hope. I think we need to be asking God to show us how we can engage with others right in front of us, in our context, to offer hope. Is it possible that God has given us, can we just be be real about the current situation? Is it possible that God has given us this virus, this coronavirus, as an in to offer lasting hope? Is it possible that what we're experiencing around the world, and I'm not trying to make light of it, but is it possible that, that God has given this as an opportunity to offer something of lasting value? What happens next in this text is a bit jarring because it seems so unrelated, but, but I think it's related. Right? If you've ever presented the truth of the gospel to anyone, you have probably experienced that in that moment there's, there's a brick wall that's hit. Right? The offer of hope and eternal life and then nothing, right? Look at what Jesus does in verse 16. He gets to the point of revealing the need. He reveals the need of the woman. He says, he changes subjects altogether, and and he tells her, go get your husband and bring him back. Now, he hasn't even been in the conversation, but but Jesus puts that in to to get to the point. And and because Jesus is God, he has the ability to know things that we don't know, uh, but he knows her and he knows her need and so he talks about it he just puts it out there he doesn't come out and and condemn her Do do you see that he doesn't come out and condemn her he asks her a question to continue the conversation he reveals to this woman her need he asks a question to open a door to talk more about the current sin in this woman's life. But I think we learned from Jesus here that, that even uh, the talking about sin can be done in a way that's not a turnoff. Right? Jesus allowed the woman to come to grips with her own sin. He says, go get your husband. And she responds, I have no husband. And, and Jesus says, you're right. You're right about that. You've had five husbands, and the guy you're currently with is not even your husband. And this probably explains why this woman is at the well at noon. She's looked down upon because of her lifestyle. She's had a a pattern of problems. And and what is her real problem? She may be promiscuous, but but is that her, her real problem? Is her problem that she's had a list of men in her life? Yes and and no. Her problem is that she's replacing her real need with something that will never be fulfilling. Friends, listen, is that unique to her? Are we able to read this text and think, wow, that's, that's really strange of her? No, it's not unique to her. That is a problem with all of humankind, you and I. Right? This must be a part of our conversation with anyone, right? even ourselves. The, the, the revealing of sin reveals our need. Jesus says, I know why you're here at noon. Right? I know why you're here alone. I know why you feel the way you do. You are trying to find fulfillment in something other than me. You're, you're masking the real problem, and you don't even know it. You, you have a need that only a Savior can fulfill. Listen, the, the gospel is not the, the full gospel without a realized need, and that realized need is ultimate, ultimately, it, it's the problem of sin being covered by a Savior. We talked about this in our township on, on on Tuesday evening. I don't even know how we got there, but, but this is something unique to Christianity and, and, and extremely beautiful about Christianity, I think, alone. That, that we would confess that, that we have a, a real need, that we would reveal to others our own deep need, a need of a Savior to cover over our sin and forgive our sin. 
And so can we just bring this into application? This is a great way for you and I, a Christian brother or sister, to relate with others, to say, I've got a need, and, and so do you. And that need is ultimately fulfilled not in anything we would find here, but in a Savior. We're in need of someone other than ourselves to make us right before God. And that need is met in Jesus. Friends, this is missions. And if you've had those kinds of conversations before, then you know what often happens when sin is brought into the conversation. You ever had those moments where you begin talking about sin and the conversation just drops out completely? Right? When, when the fact that, that, that there's a need and, and you're needy and I'm needy is brought into the conversation, what happens Im- immediately? Many will find themselves dodging the problem. They, they begin to dodge the problem, try to get out of the conversation, changing the subject. No one ever wants to admit that they're in need of a problem. I think we've got to say, yeah, that, that's just part of missions that people are going to try to dodge. It's exactly what this woman does. She tries to change the subject, and, and she does a pretty good job. Jesus has just revealed that he knows everything about her life. And she says, it seems as if you're, you're a prophet. It seems as if you are a prophet. That's right. That's, see what she does first? She builds him up, right? Compliment him. That's good. And, and then take him to something else. Get him off the subject. She tries to distract him with religious conversation. She says, well, we, we worship on this mountain where we built our temple. You all worship in Jerusalem. Can we just talk about re- religion for just a second? We need to understand that this is going to happen in our conversations with others, especially when we bring up sin, right? The, the problem of sin is dodged. The problem altogether is dodged, but our love for others compels us to talk about the need and the need fulfilled in Jesus. We're not talking uh, about sin just to jab people but to to lovingly work in step with the Spirit who is bringing conviction and revealing their need, which is what Jesus does here, right? In in love and care for this woman who doesn't yet have eternal hope in in anything, he brings her to a place of understanding, right? He, he, He moves around this dodging of the problem and brings her to a place of understanding of what belief in him is all about, defining the point. Jesus says in verse 21, woman, believe me. The the time is coming when you will be worshiping. Really what Jesus is saying is, yep, the point is worship. That is the point. In in five verses, the word worship is used 10 times. The point is worship, right? The mountain or the temple doesn't matter. It's as if Jesus is saying, you may think that that, that you're worshiping God on this mountain, but you don't know God, right? At least the Jews are worshiping someone they know, and not only that, but historically, salvation has been known to have come from the Jews. Let's let's not change the subject, woman. Jesus is not talking about history. He's not talking about unnecessary, uh, unnecessary theology. He's not trying to get into religious conversations. He's defining the point, and the point is worship. This is the point of missions, worship. The addition of worshipers who will worship the God we are, are, are all created to worship. The point is worship, and so Jesus says this mountain, that mountain, whatever mountain, that's not the point, point. and then he says in verse 23, the hour is coming, and it's here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. In fact, that's what God is seeking. This woman tried to change the subject by getting into a debate about the differences in religious views and places of worship. And Jesus says, woman, it's not about, it's not about where we worship. The point is true worship of a true God. If you're a true worshiper, your worship is in spirit and in truth anywhere because God is spirit. Get into the context here. Think about who we're talking about. It's, it's very possible, very probable, that this woman wasn't going to the temple to worship anyway. She, she wasn't uh, approaching a temple. It, it's probable that she was such an ad, outcast. She was an outcast at the well at noon, right? She was there at noon. I think she's probably an outcast at the temple as well. 
She, she probably isn't approaching the, the temple either. And, and so Jesus comforts her by saying, it doesn't matter where you feel accepted. God is seeking people to worship him. He's seeking worshipers. This is missions. Right? We're created to worship, but we replace the worship of God with the worship of self. We look inward for our own significance. God is seeking worshipers who will worship in spirit and truth. The, the point of missions is worship. Do you hear that? The, your, you in your, your house or your neighborhood, your job or your hobbies or, or wherever you find yourself, your, your friendships, even your own family, you are there for a reason. In part, the point is worship. God is seeking those who will worship him in spirit and truth. This is why Jesus came, to seek and save the lost. And so we learn from Jesus in our own missionary mentality. Do we love others enough to offer hope? Do we love others enough to have hard conversations that reveal a need, a collective need? Do we love others enough to have hard conversations even when the problem is dodged? The point, hear this, the point is not more converts to our church. The point is, it is not more converts to our church that we would grow in numbers as a church, but, but, but more and more worshipers of a God who is worthy to be worshipped. That's the point of missions. And so Jesus says to the woman, verse 26, I'm here. The one you've been waiting on is here. Look no further, I'm here. In fact, I, I think we see that, that the one she's waiting on Jesus, the Messiah, is himself a missionary. He, he is a, a missionary. That's what we see next. I think Jesus plays the role of a missionary, communicating truths about the point, worshiping God. The, the disciples come back with food, and they tell Jesus, hey, Jesus, you should eat. You're human, like we are. You should eat. You're weary from our travels. And, and while in his humanity it's true that he needs to eat, his driving motivation is not fueled by physical sustenance. It's fueled by the fact that he's sent by God, and he's sent by God to do God's will. That, that's a missionary. All right, to say that Jesus is a missionary is probably hard for us to grasp, isn't it? It doesn't really fit into our context. Not only is he bringing the message, here's what we've got to understand that's different about us, he, not only is he bringing the message, but he himself is the message. And, and he knows that. He's been sent for that very reason to carry out God's plan for his life to seek and save the lost. But Jesus isn't the only one sent to do God's will. He also tells the disciples about their place. He says in verse 35, look out over Samaria. This woman is just one of many who are ready uh, for, for harvest. God is the one who changes life, and, and he's inviting you, disciples, to be a part of that. Can we listen to this? We never know where we will fit into that equation. We don't know where we fit in. Some sow the seeds, this is what Jesus says, some sow the seeds, some reap what has already been sowed by others. Our role is to be faithful, to be a worker of the harvest, no matter where we come in on the job. That's a missionary knowing that the point is worship. And we've been invited in to point more people to a lasting hope, to, to living water, to, to eternal life. So would you listen to that th this morning? The point is worship. And, and, and if you're someone who is following Jesus, worshiping because of what he's already accomplished, listen, you're invited in. You're invited in to participate. You've been sent here by God to do his will. And in part, that includes you being a missionary to your own context, whatever that is. A voice of the good news of Jesus as our only hope in your context. Hear Jesus' words, the fields are ripe and ready for harvest and you've been invited in as a worker in that way. The, the point is more worshipers of God. And there's an outcome there's an outcome to that, and the outcome is belief. 
I think that's what we see in, in these final verses. We'll jump around a little bit. This is the outcome, belief that Jesus is who he says he is, that he came to do God's will. He came so that right relationship would be restored between us and God, that, that we would be invited in to worship. This is the outcome, belief. Belief, belief that is worship. Do, do you catch that? It, belief that is worship, all because men, women, boys, and girls have come to know that Jesus is the Savior of the world. And I think we see this outcome in, a, in, in three different ways in this text. I think, I think we see that the, the woman believes because she met this Savior. So if you jump back up to verse 27, we see the disciples have come back with food. They're amazed that Jesus is talking with this woman, but they don't say anything. They, they just observe. I just get this picture of the disciples thinking, I'm not sure why he's doing this, but, but we'll just watch and see where this goes. And I think what they observe is a changed life. A true belief, true conversion. We, we see it in a few ways. First, in, in verse 28, John is very clear to tell us this detail. I don't know if you see it in verse 28. That the woman left her water jar. Why did John give us that detail? The, Here's why. The, the, the very thing she went to the well to do, she leaves behind. And so is it possible that John is trying to communicate the very thing she was looking to fulfill in her life now really didn't mean much to her at all? As an outcast in her culture, she came at noon to get water, but she gets Jesus. And she walks away with no need of water. Listen, here, here's the truth. True belief, true conversion is evident in the abandonment of things that once brought us meaning. Let me say that again. Uh, true belief, true conversion is evident in the abandonment of things, uh, the letting go of things that once brought us meaning. Secondly, I think we, we see a changed life in this woman, uh, true belief in this woman, um, in, in this way. Why does, she walk, uh, why does she walk away? Do you see it in verse 28? Uh, why? To, to go back into the town where she's probably an outcast. She's that woman, right? And, and she goes back into that town to tell others who, who are probably her enemies, right? To tell others about the Savior she just met. True belief, true conversion compels us to tell others about the hope we have, no matter who it is. Right? The woman believes because she's met Jesus. And I think we also see that many believe because of her testimony. Right? We're told that many Samaritans believe because of her testimony. They heard her story and had belief in that same Savior, the, the one she believed in. Right? She's become now a missionary. Right? Many believed. We're also told that many more believe because of the truth. The truth that they heard from whom? Jesus himself. The people say in verse 42, it's no longer because of what you've said, woman. It's because we've heard the truth from Jesus himself, and now we believe he's the Savior of the world, right? E even of us Samaritans. Belief in Jesus as Savior is the outcome of missions, and, and really what that is is worship. And so would you listen to this as we finish this off this morning? The point, again, is worship. The point is worship. As a church, we desire to be marked by a missionary mentality. And we see it in Jesus. He came to seek and save the lost. If you're a follower of Jesus, your, your role, in part, it is the same, to seek out those who don't yet believe in Jesus and to point them to the only one who can save. You are a missionary, but, but do you embrace that mentality? Do we embrace that mentality? As a church, we, we also want to be marked by conversion growth that God would draw many to himself and save. But listen, the point is not just more numbers in, in our church that we would gain some significance. The point is worship. You are a worshiper. The point is worship. It's not about more people on our team. It's not about obedience for obedience sake. The point is worship. We have a God who's worthy of worship. 
He's worthy of worship, and he sent his son. John tells us in the very beginning of John, um, he sent his son as the lamb who takes away the sin of the world, redeemed, saved. That, that, that would be you and I, right? So that we can worship the God who made us. Here's where we'll finish. Uh, one day, Jesus is returning to restore all things, to restore proper order, to restore, re really to restore right worship. And, and John, th the same author, says this in Revelation 7, starting in verse 9. If you want to turn there, you can. Revelation 7, verse 9. This is how all this wraps up. He says, Behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders of the four living creatures and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. The point is worship. That's what we're made to do. And so I want to pray for us this morning in that direction. And we'll end out our time together in that way. And if you're with other people, with, if you're with your friends, with your township, with your family, then you can uh, sit around and maybe talk about, hey, how do we apply this? How do we respond? How do we apply this to, to what God has called us to be about? Let me pray. God, we come to a text like this, a, a longer text, a story about a woman who, who is in desperate need, just like we all have been. And, and we see the way that Jesus interacts with her is, is compelled by love to reach out to her, is compelled by love to, to move around even the social and cultural taboos to get to um, the heart of a person who is in desperate need. And God, my prayer for us as a church is that we would have the same kind of missionary mentality that we see in Jesus. Jesus came to seek and save the lost, and we're, um, as followers of Jesus, we're called to be a part of that. And so I pray that you would help us to have the same kind of missionary mentality, that we would seek out those who don't yet know Jesus and point them to him. Would you help us in that? And God, in this interesting time that we're in as a country, as a, really as a globe, um, in our city, I pray that you would give us unique opportunities even now to reach out to those around us who don't yet know Jesus? Would you give us creative ways to do that? No, we need your help. All of this is about worship, about worshiping you, and so I pray that we would have that in mind as we consider how to apply these things in these weeks. All this we pray in your name. Amen.